Welcome to the ninth lecture of Advanced Calculus course. In this lecture, we will discuss the continuity of inverse functions. You would probably be familiar with the definition of inverse functions. So if there is a function f, the inverse function of f is a function that satisfies the equations that uh, g evaluated at f of x and f evaluated at g of x if these two uh, values always equals x the input value then we would say that g is a inverse function of f now for a function f to have a inverse function it should be a bijective function also known as the one-to-one -one correspondence uh, as you could guess predict from the uh, notion bijective the uh, since by means two the bijective function is a function that is both injective and surjective. Uh, you you could be familiar with the notions one to one functions and onto functions. Now what does injective and surjective mean? An injective function is a function that for two different values in domain, the function values evaluated at those two different points is never equal. This is the definition of injective functions. And the uh, the graph, this means that a function cannot have a uh, cannot have a uh, same function value at two different points. So this so this function I drew here would not be injective. So we. Uh, we usually say this. Uh, we usually say this is a horizontal test, horizontal line test. Uh, you probably be f familiar with the vertical line test, uh, that uh, a test to see if a certain graph could be a graph of a function. So for a function, uh, we you cannot have a two different uh, output values for a single input value. So it should pass a vertical line test. Uh, for injective, uh, to decide if a function if function is uh, injective or not, we could use a horizontal line test. So if you draw a horizontal line at any, uh, at any y value you want, if that horizontal line passes to uh, intersects with the graph, with the graph that's a function in more than one point, then the function is not injective. So the definition of injective function goes like that. And a surjective function is a function that for uh, every L in the image of that function D here is the domain of the function f. For for every for every l in the domain of that function, it uh, uh, the definition of surjective function goes like this. For a function with domain x and codomain y. Uh, is the function is surjective a onto function if 
every element in the codomain of the function uh, for for every such element there exists a element in the domain of the function such that y is the uh, function value of that element. So what this means is that a surjective function occurs when every every single element in the codomain has a corresponding uh, uh, element in domain that the function maps that point to the point uh, point in the code uh, po the element in the codomain. So this is the definition of a surjective function, and if a function is, is both injective and surjective, we say that a function is bijective. Bijective. And for a function to have a inverse function, the function should be bijective. So, in today's, uh, in this lecture's example, we would prove that a function f A function f from a closed interval a to b to another closed interval c to d, which is continuous and increasing with function value of a being c and f of b being d, we would prove that this these information these information imply that a function has a continuous inverse function g now we would like to prove this statement so we would see that a continuous function had a continuous increasing function has a continuous inverse function now first let's see if f is a bijective function so it would have a inverse function. So first we would like to check if the function is injective. Uh, a function is injective if uh, if two different points in the domain of the uh, function never has the same function value. This would this information, this statement would imply that f is a injective function, uh, and we could also uh, use the counterfactual of this statement, which would be if f if the uh, function values of two points are equal. those two points must be equal at the first place. So these two statements are equivalent. And we will, we, uh, we will prove this statement to, see, uh, to show that f is an injective function. So since f is an increasing function, if x1 and x2 are points in the domain of the function f, which is a which is a closed interval a to b, and uh, without loss of generality, if we assume that x two is greater than x one, since since f is a uh, f is an increasing function, we know that f x one is less than f x two, and this would imply that two different points could never have the same. Uh, same function value. Uh, in other words, if the function value of two points are are the same, then uh, then those two points are same at the first place. So, because of the increasing property of the function f, we could see that function f is an uh, is an injective function. And also, we would like to see if function f uh, if f is a surjective function as well. Uh, how could we how could we prove that? 
uh, for f to be a, a surjective function, uh, for every l, every element of the codomain, the interval, closed interval c to d, for every element in that in interval, there must be be a certain uh, number, let's say x, in the domain of the function such that the function value evaluated at the point equals L. Now, how do you know this? Now, since F is a continuous function, we could apply intermediate value theorem. Now, we know that L is between C and D, which are B, uh, uh, which are equal to function values at A and B, respectively. Uh, respectively. So by the intermediate value theorem, we know that there exists a x such that x is between the two values specified and uh, function value at that point equals L. So the intermediate value theorem guarantees that this function is a surjective function. So since f is both injective and surjective, we know that f is a bijective function and therefore it has a invert it has an inverse function. So we know that f is bijective and therefore it has a inverse function. Now what we need to see, uh, what we need to prove, is that g is a continuous function. Now, how would we prove this? We have to prove that g is continuous. at the two endpoints of the codomain and at the every point uh, and at every point between the two endpoints. So if we show, uh, if we prove these three cases, we could show that G is a continuous function uh, uh, G is a continuous function because it is continuous at all points in its domain. Uh, since we don't have much time to deal with all three cases, I will show you the first case when I will prove the first case when uh, that G is continuous at C, one of its endpoints, to show you how the proof goes. So, uh, using these, using similar logic, you could easily uh, prove the cases for D and all the other points. So I'll just show you the first case. Now, how do we do, deal with the first case? Now, since G is a, an inverse function of F, we know that GC is equal to A. Now, to prove that G is continuous at C, we'll use the epsilon delta definition of continuity in this case. So what that means is that for uh, for any epsilon, for any positive number epsilon, there exists a positive number delta such that uh, this relationship, the y is close to c, by a distance uh, less than delta implies that g of y is close to uh, g of c by a distance smaller than epsilon, less than epsilon. If we could prove, uh, if we could prove this statement by the definition of continuity, we could show that g is continuous at c. So now let's 
see if we could find such delta. Now, since y is an element of the domain of G, uh, it is between C and D, and therefore it is greater than or equal to C. So we could assume that uh, we could see that this statement is equal to y is less than c plus delta. And now, uh, well, let's say delta for a given epsilon, let's say delta is equal to the difference between the function value of a plus epsilon and the function value of a. We will, sh uh, we will prove that this delta is a sufficient delta that will uh, that will make this statement hold. So for any epsilon, if y is close to c by a distance uh, less than this value, then the function value of y will be close to the function value of c by a distance less than epsilon. So why is that? Now first, we know that since f is a increasing function and epsilon is a positive number, we surely know that this is a positive number. So delta, as we want, it is a positive number. And since, uh, and when y is less than c plus delta, which is, equal to f a plus a plus epsilon because f of a is exactly equal to c if y is less than f of a plus epsilon that will imply that gy is less than a plus epsilon why is that why because g is a inverse function of f y is equal to f of g of y. And since f is an increasing function, this relationship f of g of y less, is less than f of a plus epsilon will imply that the value inside the function f is actually less than the value inside the function of f as well. So g of y is less than a plus epsilon. But then, that is just g of c plus epsilon. So we obtain g of y minus g of c being less than epsilon. So, of course, we could add a absolute value there too. Uh, because y is greater than c, we know that g of y is greater than g of c due to the increasing property of function f. So since using this delta, we have obtained the result that g of y is close to g of c by a distance less than epsilon, uh, we have proven that there exists a certain delta corresponding to any epsilon, any given epsilon that uh, this statement could imply this statement. And we have prove, proven that using the epsilon delta definition of continuity, we have proven that G is continuous at C. And using the same logic, you could uh, prove that G is also continuous at D and any other point between C and D. Therefore, uh, we could prove that G is a continuous function. And therefore, F, a continuous and increasing sequence, uh, from a closed interval to another closed interval uh, has a continuous inverse function. This is the end of the ninth lecture of advanced calculus course. In the next lecture, we will learn about the continuity of composite functions. Thank you and see you in the next lecture.